frustrating and devastating, it wreaks havoc on the human person at every level of his being. Why? What is it that makes trauma so difficult to resolve? Does our brain hold the mystery? And does it hold the answer? Let's meet our guest today, Margaret Vasquez. She will answer these questions and others for us. Margaret is a mental health counselor and a traumatologist. Margaret, welcome back to Women of Grace. Thank you. This has certainly been, I think, an interesting group of programs because you have uh, begun to share with us in a dynamic way the great mystery that is the human person. I mean, God has created us in such a marvelous way, and he wa he's made us in a way that that ultimately is meant to work in order and is ultimately meant to help us achieve our truest potential. However, the difficulty is when something intervenes there, like a trauma, things can go haywire and it requires a process to put it all back in order again. That's right. That's right. I always say God's a, a God of order, not a God of disorder. But when that order gets kind of knocked off kilter through events in our lives, that order needs to, to be reestablished. So then, as Aquinas said, grace can build on our nature. Yeah. You know, and I mentioned that, that the brain, you know, is like our storage unit, you know. And uh, certainly the way in which our storage units are arranged can make a big difference in the way in which we function. Uh, and, and the storage unit, if we want to find something, we can know right where to go and get it if it's in order. But if it's in disarray, it can be very difficult to try to make our way and find the one item that we need. Many times, I think, our brains are like that. If, if we have not experienced a devastating situation, then things do work very well, and, and we're, we're able to retrieve the information and react accordingly in a, in a way proper to it. But when trauma inserts itself, then it's disordered, and there's a bunch of clutter in there that's roaming around, especially on one side of the brain. That's right. That's right. The, the left side of the brain is the side that's able to keep that order, and the right side of the brain is the, the side that typically Im impassions us and gives us creativity and helps us to see the world in, in color and beauty and music and that sort of thing. And the two being able to work together is so important because if, if we just had the sort of operation the left side of the brain gives us, we'd be more like robots, but with the right side of the brain, it would be too free flowing to actually probably get anything accomplished. <laughs> so but with the two being able to work together, we're able to to be efficient and effective in a way that still gives us uh, spirit and life. Yeah, and, and I'm very aware of the fact that when we talk about the left hemisphere of the brain, the right hemisphere of the brain, and the functions that are pertinent to each, that's reversed for the person like myself who happens to be left-handed, right? That's right. I, I'm a little um, partial to to right-handed people. But, <laughs> but you still accept me in, right? That's right, that's right. That's right. You're still accepted the way you are. So. Now, all, all of this to say that we should, the, the most, um, the, the best way to say it is that the left side of the brain, um, instead of saying the left side, to say the, the non-dominant side, or the, the side that corresponds to the, the dominant hand, meaning if someone's a right-hander, then what I am saying applies the left side of the brain's the logical orderly part. For a lefty, it's reversed. Yeah, it would be the right side of the brain that's the logical orderly, orderly part, which is why they say left-handed people are in their They're right, right <laughs> minds, and I kind of like that very much, quite <laughs> frankly. But uh, we really want for you all to understand and have a deeper appreciation of the majesty with which God created you and the way in which our brain is to work in this correlative fashion that helps for all to get done and yet for us to see in the midst of it the beauty that is there, experience the joy that is there, and see the hand of God moving through it. So we designed a graphic, you did a graphic for us that we want to put up, and I'd like you to walk us through this graphic and explain to us the way in which the brain functions when all is going well, when all is copacetic and both hemispheres of the brain are working according to the way in which God designed them to do. So let's take a look at that graphic right now, friends. We're putting it up on the screen for you there. And um, we're going to use a, a little handy uh, <laughs> schematic here on the set. Go ahead. Uh, what are we looking okay. at, Margaret? Well, with the left side of the brain, you can see it's the side that, that we use in order to do logic. We have two verbal areas in the brain, and they're both on the I'm, I'm going to say this as though it's for right-handed people. That's fine. Lefties, if you can just switch this. But the two verbal areas of the brain are on the left side of the brain. Or, or, the right, the two verbal areas. Um, left hemisphere of the brain is the side that we use to do math. Math is um, strictly a, a left brain function. Problem solving is something we do with the left side, which kind of makes sense. It's the side that's more logical. The left side stores information in a, in a very orderly, sequential format. 
I kind of like to say that it, everything that you would stereotypically associate with a, a computer geek or an accountant, those sort of tasks, the left side of the brain is the side we use to do those things. Um, the left side of the brain can experientially differentiate between past, present, and future. If something's in the past or something is not now but is coming up, the left side of the brain gets that in, a, in an experiential way. Um, the left side of the brain, because we have the verbal areas on that side and also because that side likes things orderly and sequential, when we tell a story, we tell it in order with a beginning, middle, and an end in words. Mm -hmm. By contrast, the right side of the brain is the more creative, artistic side of the brain. It's the side that's, that tends to be more musical. Not to say that, um, that somebody necessarily has to be an artist or a musician to have a, a right brain, but it's the <laughs> side we use to appreciate those things. It's the side that, that tends to be more emotional. We tend to make a decision more based off of gut feeling or intuition mm -hmm. when we're making it in a right brain sort of way, as opposed to making it based on logic and strictly the facts. The right side of the brain stores information in what can seem like disconnected bits and pieces of information. Typically, it's um, almost like a, a stream of consciousness way uh, that's sort of free flowing. One tangent connects to another. The right side of the brain experiences time like it's now. And that, for trauma purposes, becomes a problem. But it doesn't have to be a problem. It can be using the imagery that we can have in the right side of our brain to picture ourselves doing something effectively like in terms of sports or in terms of any tasks that we want to accomplish. So we can use that experience of time as now. You, you might um, think of a, an athlete who's trying to inspire themselves to, to work harder at practice or that sort of thing who's um, maybe they're an Olympic hopeful and they're picturing the flag being lowered and the national anthem playing and that sort of thing and can feel like they're right there on the podium. I think that would be very useful in prayer, for example, That's especially right. if you're doing an Ignatius form of meditation, you know, where you put yourself into the scene. That's right. That's right. It, it, I think it's a beautiful thing that um, there's a, there are a lot of different prayer formats that lend themselves to lend themselves to right brain or to left brain, and some to both. Mm -hmm. so, um, right side of the brain, because we don't have verbal areas on that side, we tend to tell the stories that the right brain encodes in the way that we do have on that side, mm -hmm. which is usually in a creative way. A lot of times songs or art or any kind of different artistic works are done based off of different events that people have gone through. Oftentimes people's trauma stories are told through their art or through their music, but a lot of times it's told by acting it out. Mm -hmm. it, usually with children we refer to that as acting out. A lot of times you see it in that way. But this is how the, the brain is supposed to function, the left side and the right side, the tasks that they do. And because we have the area together um, in the middle, the corpus callosum that connects the two sides, we're able to use both sides together in an integrated way. All right. Now, trauma interrupts this flow. And we began to talk about that yesterday. And one side becomes dominant over the other when we experience a trauma. Can you explain to us again what happens in that trauma so that the, the right hemisphere for the right-handed person, left hemisphere for the left-handed person, uh, becomes in a sense constricted, your word, uh, and is unable to really operate effectively? That's right. The stress hormones that are released in the body um, as a result of the trauma the person's experiencing cause the orderly logical side of the brain to constrict. So the traumatic memory becomes encoded in the right side of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, because of that, the event continues to be experienced like it's still going on. And because of that, the right side of the brain can continue to stay very kind of overactive and leaves the left side um, very underactive, mm -hmm. which can lead to a lot of um, disarray and frustration and poor functioning in a person's life, mm -hmm. a lot of pain and suffering. You know, and I'm thinking about the fact, because of the, because of the way in which the, the brain is integrated through the uh, corpus callosum, and because of, of the fact that, you know, perhaps you experienced trauma as a child, and time has passed now, and now you're an adult, but there are stimuli, as we've talked about uh, in, in one of our other programs, there are stimuli that can cause that pain and that trauma to come rushing back, you know, with flashing force, and suddenly we're transported 
and our body is reacting and we're acting out of it in a way in which uh, would be as if it were happening immediately to us. But then there's that other side of us that's saying, wait, 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 you know, that, that's not going on now, that's not going on now, except that I feel like it's going on now. And, and it, it seems as though it would really put the person into a state of chaos interiorly. That's right. You know, all the information that, that we're discussing, and we have to remember that as traumatized people, we don't have this information. So when we're in our regular everyday life and the stimuli is encountered that um, it, it becomes like a landmine that mm -hmm. we walk through our day and step on these little landmines of stimuli that were present in traumas of the past and suddenly we're transported with no knowledge of, um, of why or, or how or what to do about it or um, a lot of times those emotions can come rushing on even without the thought of the event from before and it does like you say leave the person feeling very um, incompetent and very vulnerable. Yeah, and, and I, I'd like to just kind of give an example because uh, I think that, that this is helpful. And, and let me just ask a question to, to you out there, you know. Um, do you sometimes uh, react in a way that is far out of proportion to the injury that's been caused to you in the present? I mean, if Aunt Mary Lou brings her blueberry pie, is it going to make that much difference to you that people might eat her blueberry pie than your pumpkin pie? I mean, you know, here's the question, but the, the response is so great and the upset is so tremendous and it's eating away at you interiorly. That's one way in which we might say this is rooted in something mm -hmm. far deeper than, you know, Aunt Mary's blueberry pie. Something else is going on here, you know? That's Go That's ahead. right. I, I always, um, I always say, because I think it's easy to remember. The rule of thumb is, if someone's acting like they're not in their right mind, they're probably in their right brain. Now that oh, that would be okay. reversed for <laughs> for lefties, but it's a good rule of thumb, and it, it helps. In, it can help in relationships and and in situations like you just mentioned. If you find yourself overreacting and having an internal response that that you really know on some level kind of doesn't match the event at hand, you can have some idea that it has something to do with more than what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just think that that helps for us to realize that, that in some way, you know, many of us have experienced a trauma and we want to get to that root because as you said earlier on, it's when we get to the root of the trauma and not just taking care of the symptoms but getting to the root that we can actually find the healing and the hope that is there for us. That's right. Friends, about the way in which we respond to trauma, the hope and healing that is available to us when the trauma that we've experienced is long held and has been long lived in our lives and in our personal relationships. Our guest is Margaret Vasquez. Father Ed Sylvia is with us. And you know, Father, uh, I was thinking about the illustration that you used the other day when you talked about the fact that you had been in two fires. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the way in which the brain is meant to function normally. But sometimes these traumas uh, actually are so re-experienced by us because of stimuli that, that is associated with them that we become prisoners of them. And just the slightest thing sets us off on a tangent that we wonder how we ever got to where we ended up from where we began in that moment. Well, you know, part of this is a testimony to, again, the wonder of the complexity of the human person. Our senses play a very important part in our lives and often it's only at difficult moments that we realize often when they're not giving us the, the information that really we would want them to give us that we realize that, wait a minute, yeah, these are all, as you said, some, sometimes the strongest is odor mm -hmm. taking you right back to something. Yeah. That was a difficult time. Mm -hmm. And these thoughts become intrusive thoughts. I mean, they <laughs> flood us. And, um, and they're, they, they're like a deluge, I think, that, that can overwhelm us and overcome us uh, at any given point in time. And while in the first segment there, we showed uh, our viewers the way in which the brain is meant to function when everything is going well and there's no intrusion of trauma in our lives, when trauma enters in, quite another matter grows up. So let's take a look at that graphic, Margaret, and let's have you walk us through that and help us to understand the way in which this um, whole process that God designed gets skewed because of a traumatic incident. So okay. let's talk about the symptoms resulting from storage of tra traumatic moments here. Okay. Well, like we had said before, with the left side of the brain becoming underactive, what happens is instead of being able to do logic and problem solving like we normally would, instead there's a, a sense of confusion and, a, and, and ineptness at being able to figure things out. 
um, uh, difficulty solving problems, even even standard problems of the day. A lot of times people become um, very disoriented even uh, directionally or even in the order of things that they want to do in the day. Um, alexithymia, the big fancy word that's up there, and that's a, a difficulty expressing yourself verbally, mm -hmm. which makes sense since the left side of the brain has two verbal areas that with that side being underactive, it's, it's very difficult to communicate oneself verbally. Since the left side of the brain is the side that is typically orderly and organized, uh, there's a sense of disorganization. And also with the left side of the brain, um, being the, the problem solving side, instead of being able to come up with a, a, a problem solving a, a solution that fits this event in this day, instead the person will oftentimes try to use uh, the solution that they thought would have or wished would have fit in the trauma before. So in, in that way they kind of recreate the situation. With the right side of the brain being overly active, um, instead of just being emotional, now the person can be overly emotional. Um, and instead of information being stored in more of a, a creative, free-flowing way, mm -hmm. now it can be very disorganized. Um, and since the right side of the brain experiences events like they're here and now, the person can um, be subject to, to flashbacks or nightmares, that sort of thing, um, intrusive thoughts and feelings like you had mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And um, the person can translate that onto to even to, to objects or to people, to relationships or situations that have nothing to do with the trauma from the, from the past and all of a sudden those people and, and places and things from the past that were traumatic and painful, um, now 